Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Coming up on today's show, the British government is once again embroiled in a racism row after a top Tory donor said the country's longest serving black member of parliament made him hate all black women and she should be shot. Our Downing Street correspondent Simon Pusey will soon be joining me in the studio to discuss the fallout from the hateful comments targeted towards Diane Abbott and the African Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum has announced the launch of its Growth Accelerator program in Nigeria in partnership with iconic global lingerie brand Victoria's Secret. Irene Ochem, AWIF's founder and CEO, will shortly be joining me from Cape Town with further details about the initiative. Then later, Uluwashoga Oni, CEO and co-founder of the affordable health diagnostic business MDAS, will be joining me from Boston to discuss the group's expansion plans following a successful round of investor funding. But first, let's begin the show by taking a look at what's been trending on social media platforms this week. And we begin with LinkedIn. Owen Omogiafo, Group Chief Executive Officer of Transcore, uses this post to celebrate the women of Nigeria's leading diversified conglomerate during Women's International Month. Owen celebrates the listing of Transcore Power, hailing the move as history-making and the definition of the International Women's Day theme, which is to inspire inclusion. And on X, Nigerian presidential spokesman Bayo Onanuga comments on the return to access holdings by Agboje Aig Imokwade, who co-founded the bank with the late Herbert Wigwe. The attached letter states that the decision to bring back Mr. Aig Imakwade as the group's non-executive chairman reflects the board's commitment to the bank's core values. And on Facebook, Reuters reports that shares in Spanish-based Inditex, the parent firm of popular retailer Zara, jumped 5.9% during the week after the business reported positive early spring sales boosted by upmarket fashions. Their news article goes on to say that Inditex is expanding in America, its second largest market after Spain, and plans Zara store openings in Los Angeles, Las Vegas and Cambridge, Massachusetts. The British Prime Minister is under pressure to return millions of pounds to a Tory donor who made racist remarks about a former Labour MP. Rishi Sunak said on Wednesday that Frank Hester's remorse should be accepted after the businessman said that Diane Abbott, Britain's longest serving black MP, made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. Hester has donated £10 million to the Conservatives in the most recent financial year and has funded helicopter trips for Shunak across the country. The former Shadow Home Secretary has since filed a complaint with the Metropolitan Police. Abbott has been a vocal advocate against racism and, as a prominent black woman in British politics, has faced significant racist abuse throughout her career. Well, for more on this, I was earlier joined in the studio by our Downing Street correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, for obvious reasons, this is quite a sensitive subject for me because... I don't know if you can tell I am a black woman. Um, so by default, I'm a victim of Hester's comments, however dated um, they are. Wednesday, again, really painful, seeing a 70-year-old woman standing up in Parliament, I believe it's like 44 or 46 times, to contribute to a debate about her and not being given the opportunity to. Can you unpack this and how... It's possibly difficult for Sir Rishi Sunak, not Sir Rishi Sunak, Rishi Sunak, who says we should move on. Uh, but then, you know, talking about hateful speech in Parliament is a serious issue. Two MPs have been murdered because of rhetoric like this. Yeah, and there's lots of different facets to this. Let's yeah. just start by saying Diane Abbott, obviously a, a trailblazer for women in politics, black women in politics. Um, and so, yeah, it was really sad to see her trying to speak on the topic, which was the topic of the day, right? It's what they both started with. It's what Sir Keir Starmer started attacking um, Rishi Sunak on. So you'd expect maybe the subject of that to be able to give her say or to ask a question. So um, there's also what we've got to talk about is the new, new definition of extremism that the yes. government has put out, um, which a lot of people would say, well, this is clearly one of those yeah. definitions, right? Um, so uh, she had the party whip withdrawn, um, Diane Abbott. So that's another thing to um, add after she talked about um, Jewish, Irish and traveler people not being subject to racism. She apologized um, immediately for that. Um, the problem what does is that mean, though? So it means that she's an MP, but she cannot 
You well, she's powers? she's not a she's an MP, so she still represents you know the the area that she um, she was voted in for, but she's not a, 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 a Labour MP at the moment, right. so she's sort of an independent. Yeah. Um, but it is quite confusing, um, and I think there's yeah there's lots of different sort of sides to this. I think if we go to the Conservative new definition of extremism, this is uh, the promotion or advancement of violence, hatred, or intolerance. So if we look at what Frank Hester said, who's this um, Tory donor, the biggest to um, donor the Conservatives have ever had, um, he said that. Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and um, that she should be shot. So surely that, <laughs> that what he said there, which wasn't a long time ago, 2019, that would be in the new definition of extremism or really any definition of extremism. So the it's very tough for the Conservatives <laughs> who are trying to make this new definition of extremism, I think, due to um, the protests that we're seeing weekly in London um, about what's happening in Gaza. Um, and I think, you know, Cynics may say, but I think a lot of people would say that this is a kind of a vote winning. They're trying to stir up some tensions, some racial tensions, yes, um, to sort of appeal to They're their base. They're known to have done that. Yeah, so I think it. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? And it's it's another day, another week, another Tory race row, yes. um, which seems to be happening all the time. But this one is really. He's apologised, and uh, Rishi Sunak seems to say, you know, there's an apology. Let's move on. But is that enough? I know Diane Abbott has she has um, reported this to the police. Do you think we're going to be seeing more on this, or do you think it's... Definitely well, I, I think we. every time we sit here, we seem to come up with another example of something, and yeah. uh, obviously journalists now will be digging around to find things that other people have said. I think part of the reason that they... Um, Rishi Sunak is so keen to accept his apology um, is not only because he's given them quite a lot of money, um, but before when they've done this, and they've, I think David Cameron years ago, um, got rid of a, a Tory donor, and he went to UKIP and gave them a bunch of money, so they might be looking at um, reform and thinking, oh, we don't want him to... Yeah. Sort of jump ship, um, but people are saying rightly. I think double standards when it comes to conservatives. Um, you know, uh, on anti-Semitic co comments, they'd be on it like a shot. Yeah. Whereas this, it's kind of like, oh, well, this happened many years ago, and he's apologised. So um, it's also quite hard for Rishi Sunak to point to his government and talk about the racial diversity diversity in it, which of course there is, um, and obviously the Conservatives have had a few female uh, Prime Ministers, um, but then also being so quick to admonish someone who said something so horrific um, and continue to take money from people like that. So um, yeah, it's, it's not been, a, it, I, I mean the last few weeks have not been edifying really for UK politics or UK Parliament and what a lot of people, including Diane Abbott, are saying is imagine if you're a small black girl and you're watching this unfold and then there's absolutely no reason why you'd want to get into politics if that's the kind of standard that we hold ourselves to. So, um, yeah, I think this this story has quite a lot of legs in it, actually, and I think um, not just this, but there might be more examples that come out from it. And we are certainly living in a time of, um, yeah, real kind of bigotry and hatred going right into our parliament. Absolutely. Worth mentioning as well that both uh, black Conservative MPs, Kwasi Kwarteng and Kemi Badenoch, before the Prime Minister, um, stood up and said it is racist and that they stand in solidarity with Diane Abbott, even if they don't agree with her politics. Really shocking. And hopefully a Diane, at 70 years old, can feel safe when she's walking the streets. And they were they were ahead of the game, weren't they? They were yeah. ahead, of the, were the ahead of the government. Of I the think party, the, problem, yeah. the problem with Rishi Sunak is he's so often following now, um, and that makes him look weak as a Prime Minister, because what would be quite easy for him to do in, in Prime Minister's questions is to stand up and say to Diane Abbott, look, I apologise, yes. um, we've we got this wrong. We have spent the money, but we won't be taking any more money. And then that sort of kills the, you know, it, it sort of wraps up the story a little bit. Um, he didn't do that. Um, and then he's sort of chasing his tail because he was for so long saying that this was wrong, but he was refusing to call it racist. And then, as you say, two of his own MPs come out ahead of him and say it was racist. And then he then goes to say it's racist. So it's sort of, yeah, he's, and he seems to be doing that on a whole range of issues at the moment. So it's, as we always say, the Conservative Party's in, in trouble at the moment. Um, and yeah, when when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor, you know, and during COVID times, he was setting the agenda. He was coming out, he was yes. doing... Now he's trying to play catch-up with his own party. Absolutely. Uh, shocking a story, and we hope Diane Abbott does um, get the justice she does deserve. Thank you. Thank you. The Africa Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum, or AWIF, has partnered with the iconic women's lingerie brand Victoria's Secret to empower women entrepreneurs on the continent. The collaboration of the Tor Impact Fund and AWIF's Growth Accelerator programme is designed 
designed to support high growth oriented women owned or women led ventures with high level business development and growth strategy training. I'm pleased to say that AWIF's founder and CEO Irene Ochem joins me now from Cape Town to shed more light on this initiative. Irene Ochem, uh, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. So talk to us about the Growth Accelerator program, which I know you launched last month. And please, how did you manage to partner with such an iconic brand, the Victoria Secrets? Well, thank you, uh, Juliana, for having me. Um, it's a great pleasure. Um, yes, Irene Ochem, uh, we are, are with Africa Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, we run a growth accelerator program. It's our flagship program called the AWIF Growth Accelerator Program. We've been implementing this program since 2018, partnering with uh, NetBank, uh, African Development Bank, and uh, other organizations. So last year in September 2023, uh, Victoria's Secret launched a new initiative called um, the Impact um, uh, Fund. Um, the and um, and they were looking for uh, the fund is supposed to support uh, women entrepreneurs, you know, to uh, advance gender um, uh, equality and economic empowerment and uh, amplifying women's voices. And we we are one of the four organizations um, that they selected from across the world. So it's AWIF um, out of Africa, another organization from Nigeria and then for one from Japan and one from Colombia. So we are the four uh, impact partners for Victoria's Secret on the Tour Impact Fund. Um, of course, it's, it's huge. It's a great one, um, partnering with an iconic, um, you know, a global a brand like a Victoria's Secret, one that is also um, very close to women. So we'll be implementing this program uh, in Nigeria. Talk to me then, Irene, about what exactly their impact fund is trying um, to achieve. Okay, so the impact fund with the uh, tour impact fund, Victoria's Secret is looking for an organization that can come up with a program that will um, uh, help to advance gender equality and um, economic empowerment. So we uh, proposed our growth accelerator program. So with this program, we are going to work with 20 women entrepreneurs from Nigeria, women who are in um, early stage of their businesses, tech enabled, post revenue, and looking to raise finance. So we'll work with them, training, mentorship, and then uh, getting them investment ready, after which they are then channeled to um, uh, finance. So there must be businesses who are looking to raise financing. And um, there must be businesses that are really um, have a very high potential for scalability and profitability. So by the time we finish with them, it's going to be a seven month uh, program of training, of mentoring one on one, really high impact, high uh, contact uh, program. And then uh, we are also working with Victoria's Secret. And then at the end of the program, they are channeled to access uh, funding to be able to scale and expand their businesses. We've got millions of women watching right now, Irene. How can they get involved in um, the Accelerator program? Like you said, has been going for several years. That's your flagship program, but particularly your partnership with Victoria's Secrets and this Impact Fund. How can they get involved? Yeah, the partnership with Victoria is a great opportunity for uh, businesses in Nigeria. So you must be a business that is based and operating in Nigeria. You must be either female-owned or female-led, and by that we mean C-suite leadership. Yeah. Or you have a product that uh, this, uh, you know services uh, female uh, issues, you know, and uh, you must be post-revenue because we want you want to raise finance. So you must be a minimum three years in operation, or if not, you are a very great innovative tech-enabled business that is ready to raise um, growth and um, um, to raise financing to grow. So Nigeria-based, um, female-led or female-owned or product that services women issues and then uh, post-revenue. And you can uh, apply for the program. The call for application is out. Deadline is 24th of March. So there is still um, some guy. And you find the link to apply in our, in our website, 
not elsewhere. On our website, you have the link. While access to diagnostic health centres in Africa remains a challenge, efforts are being made to improve infrastructure, increase funding and expand healthcare services to underserved populations. Nigerian health startup MDAS Global, which operates a fast-growing healthcare network, has raised a three million US dollar pre-Series A round of funding to further develop its proprietary technology platform Beacon OS. Uluwa Shoga Oni, CEO and co-founder of the firm, joins me now from Boston for more on this. Uluwa Shoga Oni, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. So please explain to us how this new round of funding, congratulations by the way, um, will contribute to improving healthcare delivery across Nigeria. Of course, we know we so desperately need it. Um, thank you so much, um, and thanks for having me here. Um, with this new round of funding, we're, which we're very, very excited about, we will be able to expand their building more locations, and then we'll also be able to expand their partner with existing diagnostic clinics all across the country to be able to attend to um, patients all over the, the country. Um, more importantly, also, we will use this new round of funding to also build more of the technology platform we've been building over the past year or so, um, to connect, to kind of digitize a lot of the processes um, of the of connecting us to the HMOs, connecting us to our doctors, to connecting us to our corporate partners. The budget, um, Oluwa Shoga, I know you're in Boston, but I'm sure you've got an ear to what's been happening in Abuja. It's been a hot topic of discussion um, this week. We know, you definitely know, because you're an expert in the field, that the healthcare sector in Nigeria is audaciously underfunded, low budget allocations, inefficient use of resources. Have you given up working with government? Is it a struggle communicating with them or is your business model you know, forging forward without any government assistance? So, so for us, um, that's a very interesting thing. Even though I'm in Boston right now, I still spend a whole lot of time in Nigeria and I know what is going on. Mm. The honest truth is that, you know, in terms of funding of the sector, Nigeria is in a tough spot right now with funding, right? And so for us, we see ourselves as complementary mm. to what the government is doing. You know, we invest in heavily in the diagnostic sector, in the healthcare sector in Nigeria, because we know that the government alone cannot do all the investment that needs to go into the sector. So we see ourselves as complementary to everything the government is doing. And even in many places, not only do government facilities sometimes would use us when they don't have the equipment, um, to in, in within their own facility, we would be able to serve them um, with our own facility. So in, in effect, you know, we are supplementing what the government is already doing in many places. And in places like Lagos, where you know there's a lot more funding in Lagos, you know, we see less government um patient, um government hospital patients. But in places where um the government has not invested as much heavily into the healthcare sector, for example, we tend to see a lot more um hospitals, government hospitals also use our services. Oluwa Shoga Oni, who is the MDAS CEO and co-founder. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations once again. And we yes, look forward to following your expansion. Thank you. Now to my final story. Africa has seen significant growth in the fintech sector in recent years, with various startups and financial service providers emerging to address the continent's unique challenges and opportunities. Excess.com is one of those firms that has expanded its presence into new regulated jurisdictions. And Mabianini Firi, a senior market analyst at the firm, joins me now from Johannesburg for more on this story. Talk to me um, about why excess decided to take this path and the acquisition of Ubatebi Financial Services? Sure. So as technology continues to advance, you know, at an exponential rate, the fintech space uh, in which excess.com operates uh, grows alongside it. However, this growth also brings forth uh, significant concerns, you know, regarding security. Consequently, investors are becoming increasingly discerning, uh, opting only to collaborate with uh, regulated entities, particularly within the South African context. So we place a paramount emphasis on uh, customer centricity. Uh, we consider uh, we we consistently strive to uphold stringent standards and processes 
from a regulation point of view, making a priority the safety and security of funds uh, for our valued end users. So ultimately, our decision to acquire the necessary license um, is a pivotal aspect of our strategic approach aimed at fostering trust and uh, confidence in our platform. How are you doing that with education? Sure. So uh, we recognize the importance of empowering traders uh, mm. specifically through education and uh, research, um, especially considering the diverse levels of financial literacy across the continent, to ensure that uh, potential clients make informed investment decisions on our platform. We have implemented several approaches um, focused on education, uh, accessibility, and user-friendly resources, such as um, expert analysis and insights, personalized learning routines, um, and also just uh, general community engagement uh, when it comes to that aspect. We are deeply committed to empowering traders um, with the necessary knowledge and resources, recognizing the diverse levels of financial literacy prevalent across the continent to ensure that um, the potential clients can confidently navigate their investment decisions on our platform. We have implemented um, several uh, approaches that span various channels, um, in addition to providing online resources such as um, expert analysis. Um, uh, like I mentioned, you know, we also actively engaged uh, in uh, offline and online seminars workshops, uh, and also just uh, educational events. Um, these in initiatives obviously not only offer value opportunities for in-person learning, but um, also a sense of community among traders, which is uh, of utmost importance to us. Our team of senior market analysts, strategists, and uh, experts around the globe uh, further aid in providing uh, comprehensive support when it comes to that aspect. Absolutely. Ex inclusive education um, is absolutely uh, vital. I want to ask you, of course, about the hot topic of the moment, which is crypto trading. It ebbs and flows, doesn't it? I think it was on Monday, Bitcoin reached 70,000 US dollars. I presume this is, of course, due to uh, the halving event, which is going to take place um, next month. But aside from what's happening with the boom in Bitcoin, there was some controversy in Nigeria with Biden. Finance. I believe the central governor, um, the central bank governor in Nigeria um, last month argued that crypto exchanges in the country were suspected of handling illicit transactions, uh, pointing to suspicious flows of funds at Binance. Of course, that's an ongoing discussion, but it's really riled up Nigerian crypto um, traders. How do you at XS.com ensure that the platform doesn't become susceptible to scams and Ponzi schemes, but then also are inclusive uh, for crypto traders? Because we know it does serve um, beneficial to those who are outside of the traditional banking environment. Correct. So safeguarding our users against scams or any fraudulent activities is our top priority. Um, to achieve this, we have implemented robust measures uh, aimed at maintaining a, a secure trading environment. Our approach begins with strict adherence to compliance and regulation, hence also the acquiring of the license, like we mentioned earlier. Um, additionally, we have established a stringent verification process uh, within our KYC policy framework, ensuring that all users undergo through uh, identity verification. Moreover, we do collaborate with the most trusted uh, payment solution providers to offer our traders peace of mind, and um, we're, especially when conducting transactions on our platform. So we understand the importance of empowering our users to make informed decisions. We encourage traders to ask the right questions as well um, and exercise due diligence before engaging in any transactions or interacting with any online brokers, uh, CFD brokers such as ourselves. Uh, should our users also additionally uh, have any inquiries uh, or concerns, our dedicated support support uh, team is available 24-7 to 8 and uh, give them uh, guidance uh, with that particular aspect. 
Well, that's good to know. 24-7 um, availability to answer any of your difficult questions. Really interesting speaking to you and good luck in your new role. Mabanini Theory, who is the Senior Market Analyst at the online fintech platform XS.com. Thank you so much for your expertise and insight today. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.